Well, hey guys, welcome to Mr. G in a Blackboard. Uh, so today we are going to talk about uh, kind of two different things. We're, we're, in general, we're going to be talking about factoring, um, polynomials, and kind of subcategories of that. We're going to start off by talking about what's called the greatest common factor. And followed by that, we're going to talk about uh, using that as well as another tool with factoring trinomials. Um, and we'll kind of see in the next video where we get into some more advanced problems that kind of combine the two, as well as talking t t uh, about a new uh, method of factoring that we can use with some more advanced problems. But let's go ahead and get started with this video. Um, again, starting with the greatest, whoops, greatest common factor. Okay, so this is pretty commonly known as just the GCF. So if you hear people talk about the GCF, that's what they're referring to. Um, and so here's the idea. Think about when you have numbers, for example, let's say I want to talk about the numbers, uh, let's say 20 and 30, right? And I ask you, what is the greatest common factor of 20 and 30? Well, to do that, first of all, you'd have to know the factors of 20 and 30 themselves in order to know which of them is the greatest that's in common, right? Hence the name greatest common factors. So if I write out factors of 20, those are numbers that if I multiply them together, give me 20, which would be these. And then if I do the same thing with 30, one, two, three, five times six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 15 and 30, and I believe I got them all there. Yep, looks like I got them all. And so now if you compare these two lists, you can see that the greatest factor that's in common between the two would be 10, right? So the GCF here would be 10, okay? Um, so we're gonna kind of apply this idea to just polynomials in general, and in other words, things that don't just involve numbers, but they involve variables. So let's go ahead and look at an example of that. So we'll call this uh, example one, okay? So example one, we're gonna look at 10x squared plus 35x, okay? Um, so I'm not gonna write out all the factors of 10 and 35. I trust you can do that. If you need to do that, that's totally fine. Go ahead and um, do it on your own if you wanna pause the video for a second. Um, but what I do want to focus on is the fact that this has an x times x. Remember, that's literally what x squared means, and this is just an x, right? So if I look at the GCF, we kind of do this in two parts. First of all, the numbers, uh, 10 and 35, their greatest common factor would be 5, right? If you were to go back and list all of the factors out like we did up here, you would see that the greatest factor that they have in common, in other words, the GCF, is 5. But in addition to that, they also share one x, right? They share an x here. This has an extra x, but this one over here does not have that extra x. So therefore, they only have one x in common. So altogether, my GCF is 5x. Now, normally, you wouldn't just stop there unless they just said, give me the GCF. Normally, what you would do is you would actually take it a step further and factor out, which is... Uh, fix this here, which is um, basically just like division, right? So if I have this and I factor out a 5x, what am I left with inside? Well, if I do 10 divided by 5 is 2, x squared divided by x is x. So here I have 2x. And then if I do 35x divided by 5x is 7, right? So this would kind of be my, my final answer. And it's always nice because you can always go back and check, okay, 5x times, whoops, 5x times 2x is 10x squared, 5x times 7 is 35x, so we're good, okay? So there's our first example of greatest common factor. And now let's look at another problem. We'll call this example 2. And let's get a little more interesting and have two variables. Okay, so again, I'm going to kind of have the same approach to this. I'm going to find my GCF number-wise. 
first. So between 10 and 15, you should see that the greatest common factor again is five. It's not always five, it's just the numbers I picked work out like that. Um, again, here I have x squared, right? So that's x times x, and then here I have one x. So they share one x, and then the y's, same idea. This has one y, this has a y times a y, so they share one y. So my GCF is five xy altogether. Okay, so now I go down here, and I'm gonna write my problem over again, and actually factor out the 5xy and see what we get. So if I factor out or divide out the 5xy, you should see that you would get, uh, let's see, 2x minus 3y. Okay, so again, the, the way that I did that is I, I did it number by number first. So 10 divided by 5 is 2. Uh, 15 divided by 5 is 3. Specifically, negative 15 divided by 5 is negative 3. x squared divided by x is x. y divided by y is 1, so those cancel. There's no y here. y squared divided by y is 1y, and then the x divided by the x also cancels. So there's no x over here. So this would be my, my final answer, okay? So let's box this off here, okay? So there's our second example of our greatest common factor. And now what we're going to do is we're going to kind of shift gears. Whoops. And we're going to uh, talk about, you know, how can I use this for more common problems like the following. So example three. Let's look at, this is a good one, 2x squared minus 20x plus, uh, let's say, 50, okay? Uh, so notice that I'm not writing any directions here. You can kind of assume that the directions, if this was on a worksheet or something, would just be factor, right? Um, so here, the reason I wanted to start with the GCF with these, uh, these two problems up top here is because the GCF, or the greatest common factor, is always your first step whenever you're factoring, regardless of what this polynomial looks like. The reason for that is because it will make your life a lot easier, as we'll see in the next video, um, when we get into what's called factoring by grouping. So here, if I didn't know how to use the greatest common factor, I'd have to use this, um, this method of factoring by grouping that we're going to discuss in the next video. But... I notice that if I look at all three of these terms, they share a greatest common factor of two, right? So what I'm gonna do is actually set this equal to two and factor out that greatest common factor and see that I'm left with x squared minus 10x plus 25, right? And so here we're gonna kind of shift gears again. And now I have a three term quadratic. And so the way that we uh, factor these or one method, there's a lot of methods out there. I'd encourage you to kind of experiment with what works for you. But the way that I do this is I kind of set up a table, keeping in mind that my goal is to separate this trinomial into two binomials being multiplied by each other. Okay, um, so I'm actually going to do my table down here. And the pattern always goes like this. So you always do find two numbers that multiply to this last number, so in this case positive 25, the sign does matter, so it's positive, but when you add them, it gives you negative 10, right? So it's kind of like a riddle. Give me two numbers that not only when you multiply them give you 25, but when you add them give, it, give you negative 10, and sometimes you won't get it right away, that's fine, um, but once you get the hang of it, you'll uh, figure it out, so sometimes it's just trial and error, so I know that this is going to be negative 5, and negative 5, because that's 25, so that works, and then negative 5 plus negative 5 is negative 10. So I take those factors and I just straight up plug them right up in here, and I get this, which I can write kind of shorthanded if I want to as this, right? x minus 5 times x minus 5 is x minus 5 quantity squared, right? And again, you can go through, you can use your FOIL method, in other words, the distributive property twice, your box method, however you like to multiply binomials, and make sure that this guy here, whoops, 
that guy there does give you the uh, the original problem above it, right? Let me just write that in there. There we go. Right. So the x minus five times x minus five, if you multiply it out, will give me this guy here. Okay. Okay. So there's uh, our first example of a quadratic trinomial. Again, first step: always see if you can factor out a GCF or a greatest common factor. Um, otherwise. There's some special technique that we have to use. Again, we're going to go over that in the next video. Okay, So the idea is that I can only use this multiply to, add to uh, kind of table or strategy here if this leading coefficient here, this number out front, is 1. So that was something that I uh, didn't mention before we did the problem. But you can see that if you actually go back here, this leading coefficient was 1, which actually does change uh, kind of the strategy that we'll use. Okay. Um, so we're going to finish off with one more example. Actually, I got two more I want to go over. Let's look at example four. Okay, so example four. So this one, we are going to look at this. Okay, actually, let's let's make this one a little bit easier, and we'll we'll do that one next. So one thing that you guys will see is a lot of times you'll get a problem like this where it'll be a quadratic but there's only two terms and there's a minus sign and I say the minus sign because that does matter so if I were to treat this similarly to the problem that I did up top here where I do the multiply to the last number add to the middle number well there is no middle number there is no middle x term in other words I could write this as x squared plus 0x minus 49, right? So now if I go back and I use my method that I used on the previous problem, I would be asking myself, what are two numbers that when I multiply them give me negative 49, but when I add them give me 0, right? That is a very weird looking 0. Let me try and make that a little better. 0. There we go. Okay. Um, so again, if you play around with some numbers, you'll see that those are negative 7. And positive 7, right? Both of those work. I get negative 49 when I multiply them, and I get 0 when I add them. So that means that this guy here can be written as x minus 7x plus 7. Okay, And actually, this is a pattern that you'll always see. This is known as what's called a difference of perfect squares. I would write that down. Maybe we'll write it over here. Difference. Sorry about my pen, it's kind of acting weird today. Of two squares. Okay, so a difference of two squares, meaning if you look here at the original problem, I have a difference, a subtraction, and x squared is a square because x squared is x squared. I know that sounds kind of weird, but if I take the variable x and I square it, I get x squared. And then if I take the number 7 and I square it, I get 49. So I have a difference of two squares. And it will always be this pattern of x minus the square root of the number, which was 7, and x plus the square root of the number. And then remember that for multiplication, you have the commutative property. So I could have written the plus here and the minus here. It doesn't matter. Okay. Um, so now let's revisit that last problem that I started to write. So we are on example 5. So example 5, we have uh, 9x squared minus 49, right? So actually, this is also a difference of two squares because I have 9 is a perfect square, 3 squared is 9, x squared is a perfect square, x, the variable x squared gives me x squared, and 7 squared is 49. So you can kind of guess that the factorization would end up being this 3x minus 7 times. 3x plus 7, right? So you kind of see that nice pattern there. Now, the reason that this has to be a difference is let's say, let's go back to this other problem here. Let's say this was x squared plus 49. So you would be finding numbers that multiply to 49, but when you add them, give you 0. I guarantee you, you're going to spend a lot of time trying to figure that out because that's not possible. There is no number that when you multiply it uh, by itself gives you a positive number but also gives you zero, right? So um, that's something that I encourage you to think through 
why that can't happen. And then you'd see why it has to be a difference of two squares. Okay. Um, so that's going to be our last problem for this video. So we had just to kind of recap here, let's go to the top. We talked about the greatest common factor. Then we went into factoring trinomials, right? Always starting with the greatest common factor if you can take something out. And then when this leading coefficient is one, like it was in this problem, and actually in this problem too, right? The leading coefficient was one. Um, this problem is slightly different. That's not a necessity. But uh, when the leading coefficient was one, we used this multiply to add to pattern. And then we had the difference of two squares, which was kind of a special pattern that we could always use. Okay, so I hope you guys found this video helpful. Feel free to come back, come up with your own factoring problems, um, and give it a shot. Thanks for watching. Bye.